Okay, so a very good afternoon to one and all present here. Today, I'm going to present my project, which is Human Brain in Space. In this project, I have basically tried to um, analyze and I have tried to understand that uh, what all changes happen inside a human brain whenever any astronaut or any cosmonaut goes into space. Also, I have tried to add a psychological angle or a psychological aspect to my project in order to evaluate, in order to understand that what all psychological changes happen inside the brain of, a, of an astronaut because these psychological changes, they affect the sleep cycle of the astronaut and also the overall personality and the overall behavior of the astronaut. So it's very interesting to see. So I would like to begin by explaining the basic structure of uh, a human brain. So as we all know that the human brain resides inside the skull. Now the skull is a hardcore structure consisting of 22 bones and uh, its major function is to protect our brain from any sorts of external dangers or any sort of external injuries. Now uh, there is a fluid which is named as cerebrospinal fluid. What is the function of the cerebrospinal fluid? Now, there are two major functions of the cerebrospinal fluid. First function is that it protects our brain from any sorts of mechanical shocks. And secondly, it acts as a cushion to our brain. And uh, the cerebrospinal fluid resides inside the skull and the spinal cord. And it also fills up the hollow spaces, which are, uh, which are uh, open spaces, the hollow spaces inside the brain. So this is a diagram which shows the three major parts of the human brain. Uh, there is this forebrain which consists of the cerebrum, the midbrain which consists of tectum, and the hind brain which consists of pons, medulla oblongata, and cerebellum. And obviously there is the spinal cord. I would like to tell you all about uh, each of these structure, each of these structures in a little bit detail. So let's begin with what is the forebrain. Now, uh, the forebrain is basically the anterior portion of the brain. It consists of two sides or two hemispheres. One is the uh, left cerebral hemisphere and the other is the right cerebral hemisphere. Now, basically, each of these hemispheres receive information from the opposite side of the body. In layman terms, it means that information, all the body information from the left hand side goes to the right cerebral hemisphere and all the information from the right side of our body goes to the left cerebral hemisphere. Also, there is an outer uh, swelling or an outer portion of the cerebrum, which is known as the cerebral cortex. Thalamus, which I'll tell about uh, it later, the thalamus is the major source of information for the cerebral cortex. Now comes the thalamus. Now, as I already mentioned that the thalamus uh, is the major source of information for the cerebral cortex. But there comes a question, what is the function of this thalamus? So the thalamus basically controls all the sensory information of our entire body. Whatever sensory information our body receives, it goes to the thalamus first. And then from the thalamus, it is further passed, uh, passed on to the cerebral cortex for further processing. Now comes the hypothalamus. What is this hypothalamus? The hypothalamus is basically a small part or a small structure which is located near the base of the brain and it is central to the thalamus. That means it is somewhere, it, it is near the thalamus. And the hypothalamus basically controls the pituitary gland. Now, what is this pituitary gland? Pituitary gland is an endocrine gland. That means it secretes hormones inside our body. Hormones uh, which are required for several processes which happen inside our body smoothly. So hypothalamus is in charge of the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland secretes the hormones inside our body. There is a question that what will happen if the hypothalamus gets damaged somehow? So if the hypothalamus gets damaged somehow, then it will affect the pituitary gland and as a result, a person will face many abnormalities related to eating, drinking, fighting, activity level of the body, etc. 
Why this happens? It's pretty simple because the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland controls the hormones. So if the hypothalamus gets damaged, then the pituitary gland is also damaged. And if the pituitary gland is damaged, then there will be a hormonal disbalance inside our body, leading to all such abnormalities. Now comes the basal forebrain. Now the nucleus basalis or this basal forebrain uh, receives its input or all its information from two portions of the brain. One is the basal ganglia and the other is the hypothalamus. So what is the function of this basal forebrain now? So the basal forebrain basically controls the brain's arousal, its wakefulness and the attention systems of our entire body. And whenever we have to basically pay attention to anything, then basal forebrain gets activated. Now comes the midbrain. So there is a major portion of the midbrain which is called tectum. Now tectum is located near the base or the roof of the midbrain and there are two swellings of this midbrain. One swelling is known as the superior colliculus and the other swelling is known as the inferior colliculus. Now what are the functions of the superior colliculus and the inferior colliculus? So the inferior colliculus controls our hearing and the superior colliculus controls our vision. Lastly comes the hind brain. So there are three major portions that make up the hind brain, the medulla, the pons and the cerebellum. I'd like to tell you the functions of the medulla and the cerebellum. The medulla basically controls the reflexes of our entire body. That means uh, heart rate, salivation, breathing, vomiting. All of these reflexes are controlled by medulla. On the other hand, uh, the cerebellum, the cerebellum controls the movement regulations of our entire body. Movement regulations as well as uh, the cerebellum is uh, regarded as the controller of uh, the balance and coordination of our entire body. To maintain the balance and coordination of our entire body, we need cerebellum. Now I would like to tell you some, uh, something in detail about the changes in the brain of astronauts or cosmonauts after coming back to Earth. Now there were uh, some scientists who were interested in this uh, topic and uh, the scientists, they uh, checked the brain images of 18 astronauts after long duration space flights and some other scientists looked at the brain images of 16 astronauts after shorter duration space flights. But uh, uh, amongst these images, uh, the scientists, they uh, conducted deep research or uh, a, depth, uh, a research in depth uh, on the images of 12 astronauts, the brain images of 12 astronauts after longer duration space flights and six astronauts after shorter duration space flights. Also, there was a group of scientists who were the observer scientists. They just uh, were there to observe the results and to observe what are the changes that are happening. So these observer scientists, they were unaware, they were not at all aware about the time duration of the space missions in order to avoid any sort of bias. So what were the observations and results? So after observing the brain images of 12 astronauts after longer duration space flights and six astronauts after shorter duration space flights, it was found that uh, there was a change in the volume of the cerebrospinal fluid at certain spaces. That means the cerebrospinal fluid, it had narrowed or it had shrinked in the brain at certain places uh, after longer duration space flights. Also, there was a vertical displacement of the brain in the upward direction. That means the brain had slightly shifted in the upward direction after longer duration space flights. If I conclude this in a statement, then after longer duration space flights, the cerebrospinal fluid, it had shrunk, it had narrowed, and uh, the brain had shifted vertically in the upward direction after longer duration space flights. So this is a diagram which shows the same. It shows that after longer duration space flights, the cerebrospinal fluid is shrinked. Uh, on the left hand side, we can see uh, the brain uh, the brain image when the uh, person is no, uh, uh, living normally on the earth. And this is after the space mission on the right hand side, which shows that there is a shrinking of or narrowing of the cerebrospinal fluid at certain places. Also, uh, it is very difficult to uh, visibly see this, but there is a minute displacement of the brain in the upward direction. 
now some other interesting findings so uh, there were some scientists who were interested about the white matter and the gray matter changes so i would like to first tell you about that what is this white matter and gray matter so white matter and gray matter basically are the assistants of the entire brain they are as a helping hand serve as a helping hand to the brain the gray matter is located near the outer portions of the brain and the white matter is located in the deep portions of the brain and the gray matter the gray matter basically controls the processing of our entire brain that the brain is functioning and processing in its in, in in the correct direction in the correct manner in the proper manner and the white matter it assists the gray matter the white matter basically controls the communication between uh, the different areas of the gray matter uh, within the central nervous system so uh, after longer duration space flights it was found that this white matter had enhanced in the cerebellum now comes the psychological and sleep changes that happen during a space flight now whenever the astronauts or cosmonauts they reach into space they all face some common problems and one of these common problems is the sms or the space motion sickness the space motion sickness further leads to certain uh, other issues for example nausea nausea is a sensation of vomiting vertigo vertigo is basically a spinning sensation it feels as if your head is spinning uh, then they feel disorientation they feel dizziness etc also uh, another problem which is faced by the astronauts is about their sleep cycles now uh, it is very much advised for both ordinary people and astronauts that one should take adequate sleep length which is quality sleep which is actually very critical for maintaining the normal physical and mental health of our entire of our entire uh, personality uh, for uh, proper rational decision making and another uh, and other sorts of work performance it's very very important to have a good quality sleep but unfortunately in the case of astronauts due to high vigilance pressure high noise levels seclusion and a monotonous routine or a monotonous repetition they are not able to get adequate sleep so it sometimes affects their crew performance as well now according to one study 58 shuttle astronauts slept for an average of only 6 hours per night while in space as compared to 7.9 hours on the ground on other several nights they reported getting less than 5 hours of sleep and sometimes even less than 2 hours so uh, there was another researcher who studied uh, that six, uh, that 64 uh, shuttle astronauts and 21 international space station astronauts they slept for 6 hours and uh, and uh, another uh, and another 5 or 4 and a half hours on average per night further analysis revealed that some crew members they slept only 20 minutes uh, less per day during the pre launch period and uh, after that 47 minutes less during the post landing period so this shows uh, that all the astronauts they are unable to get adequate sleep even after coming back to earth that is they take uh, a good amount of time to come back to their normal uh, normal sleep cycle now i would like to tell you something about the rem that is the rapid eye movement sleep rem sleep so what is this rem sleep actually rem sleep or the rapid eye movement sleep is that part of our sleep which is the deepest during our rem sleep or rapid eye movement sleep we uh, are completely relaxed and we even dream whenever we dream we are basically in our rem sleep phase that is the rapid eye movement sleep phase so this is a graph which depicts the sleep patterns during one night of a normal human being who is living on earth so there are four stages of sleep stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 and stage 4 this rem sleep occurs in between these uh, four stages stage 1 is the first initial stage when we start feeling sleepy and then stage 4 is when we have completely slept now uh, rem sleep as you all can see in the graph is not continuous it is occurring in breaks there are breaks in between and the first rem sleep phase is the shortest then it is gradually increasing uh, with the uh, rem sleep being the greatest near about 4 am of the morning so uh, this can be an indicator to the fact that why do we not remember our dreams completely 
many a times you might you might have felt that you saw something in your dream but you don't remember your dream entirely at one go why because the rem sleep is not continuous it occurs in breaks and because it's not in a sequence that's why we tend to forget or we tend to just remember certain glimpses of what we saw in our dream also if a person is sleeping at 10 pm and waking up at 6 am then the rem sleep will mostly occur between 10 pm and 12 am and between 12 am and 2 am and then mostly uh, between uh, 2 am to 4 am in which the uh, 4 am uh, rem sleep is the greatest and the deepest but in the case of astronauts it was found that their rem sleep phase was very 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 short and also uh, many astronauts they faced sleep insomnia space insomnia or sleep insomnia uh, uh, space insomnia space insomnia so in space insomnia what happens that the astronauts they feel uh, a great feeling of sleepiness that is they have a long sleep latency but they do not get adequate sleep that means their efficiency of sleep is very poor so this is called as space insomnia now furthermore the astronauts they also face many physiological and psychological problems uh, such as depression stress anxiety um, eye problems or uh, some uh, eye itch itching in the eyes Uh, they also have a weaker uh, immune response and they also have some certain personality changes because of all these disturbances so to conclude i would like to say that uh, whenever we look at the space missions we always uh, look at uh, them at uh, with an angle of astrophysics or with an angle of uh, with with an angle of mathematics but i try to look at the space missions with an angle of psychology and i try to understand that what all problems uh, are faced by the astronauts so it was very interesting overall for me to learn more about it and i hope that whatever learnings i have gained from this project they will uh, they will remain with me till my further studies so thank you